good morning and a very warm welcome to everybody out there in wherever you are in the world or here just here in Adelaide, I'm not sure. It's Easter Sunday morning here and we pray that the Lord will just be with us this morning and with you in your homes and that it be a real blessing and a real encouragement to each and every one of us today. So we'll just open with a, a word of prayer. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we stand here before you, Lord, as unworthy vessels, Lord Jesus. But Lord, we're very, very mindful, even today, Lord God, as we are every day, of the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ and all that it has done for us, Lord, and all that it avails for us, O God. For truly, Lord, there is power in the blood of the Lamb. There's power in your blood, Lord, power to save, power to set free, power to deliver, power to comfort, Lord. Oh God, and so many other blessings, Lord, that we receive through the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And above all, Lord, the forgiveness of sins. We thank you, Lord God, that you do wash our sins, Lord God. And you, Lord, you've made a covenant with your people that you remember our sins no more. And we thank you for that, Lord. What a privilege, what an honour it is, Lord, that we can gather in, gather together in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. No matter where we are, Lord, God, that you bind us together, Lord, by your Holy Spirit, Lord. And I pray this morning, Lord, that we'd be bound together by the cords of love of our Lord Jesus Christ. Lord God, that we just look past, oh God, the flesh and Look into the spirit and all that you have done for us, Lord, and all that you continue to do for us. So we honour you this morning, Lord, and we do count it such an honour, Lord, that we can gather in the wonderful name of our Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray, Lord, that you be with us this morning, that your Holy Spirit, Lord, will be present, not only here, Lord, but, Lord, to all those that are watching online, Lord Jesus, this morning. So we commit ourselves in this service into your hands and pray, Lord, that you'd have your way with us. We ask it all in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. So we're just going to have two or three songs this morning and then we'll hand over to, to Brother Brian who will bring the word for us this morning. So praise the Lord. So we'll start off singing that little chorus. Um, he paid a debt he did not owe. I owed a debt I could not pay. Amen. Oh, 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 
that first verse again. He paid a debt. He paid a the answer to all my longing. He's the answer to all of our needs. Amen. Christ is the wonderful name Lord how we can sing praises and glory to the name of the Lord Jesus Christ you truly are that great physician and you are Lord all that we ever need Lord God may our eyes always Lord be upon you Lord always Lord help us oh God forgive us for our sins Lord forgive us for all of our failings Lord Jesus Wash us in your precious blood, Lord. 
Oh, blessed be the Lord forever and ever. How we praise you and thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. As the deer pants, pants for the water, so my, so my soul longs after him. morning now. Praise the Lord. (coughs) 
Well, I greet you this morning in the name of the Lord. May God bless you. And uh, we just uh, appreciate the opportunity to be able to share uh, with a wider audience through, through the internet today. And um, I have to say that um, if, if it wasn't for this particular restrictions that we have at the moment, um, we would have never done this. But one good thing's come out of it. We've found that this is a very powerful medium and, and also appreciated by the people. So we thank the Lord for that. And may the Lord bless you, both the few that are present here and also the wider audience. We bless his wonderful name. And it's a privilege to serve the Lord in these days. And we know we're in a battlefield. You can't find a place where Satan isn't trying to infiltrate. And, but we know that the Lord is, is over all. And this morning I'd like to uh, speak to you of a, a message. It may sound um, uh, a, little, um, a little negative, but it, but, it, but it isn't. It's meant to show the truth from the scriptures in regard to the hour in which we live. And I wish to speak uh, to you on the road of no return. The road of no return. And we're going to read from the book of Thessalonians, uh, chapter 1, uh, sorry, chapter 5, 1 Thessalonians, chapter 5, and verses 1 to 5. But, the, but of the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no, read, no need that I write unto you. I think that's an important statement because there are so many opinions today about what the seasons are, what the seasons are going to bring us, but... We, 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 we thank the Lord that, that God, by his grace, helps us to understand the time and the season in which we live. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. I want you to notice that word, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all the children of light and the children of the, dark, of the day. We are not of the night nor of the darkness. Shall we have a word of prayer? Father, we thank you, Lord, this morning that we're able to come to you in the name of Jesus Christ. Your word is precious. And I pray, Lord God, that as we speak from it this morning, that you take control of this service, Lord, that you would take control of the words that are spoken, that they may be pleasing in the sight of the Lord. And I pray, Lord Jesus, that you will quicken them to our hearts and bless us, Lord. Anoint the seen and the unseen audience, Lord. Anoint me to be able to speak. And may this be a time of refreshing and blessing and also an earnest time in which we consider where we're at in the kingdom of God and in the time of God's kingdom, that we, Lord Jesus, may truly with all diligence prepare our hearts for the great event that's coming, the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. So I commit the word to you this morning, and I pray you bless it as, I, as we speak on it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I want to talk about the events leading up to the coming of the Lord. And just as a matter of uh, introduction, um, you know, for over 50 years, we've heard many different ministries from many different sources that have spoken about the coming of the Lord and have forecast certain things. I remember years ago, um, the whole thing was, was about communism. That was the main theme, communism, the Antichrist and so forth. And we realised that communi communism still exists, but in Europe, it, it, certainly, uh, it certainly has been broken down. And ministers talking about revivals, God sending a revival and God's going to do it and the people get up in anticipation and, and, and it was always going to happen very soon and it was coming, God was sending it and people got all enthusiastic about it and, and so forth and uh, talking about God sending a revival. And for 50 years we've, been, we've heard um, about God sending a revival and even recently, it's still being said that some are uh, proclaiming that there'll be a worldwide revival with millions of souls brought into the kingdom. Now, I don't want to criticise anybody else's beliefs or any, anything that they, uh, they stand for, but I, I want to try and take the perspective from the word of God 
that the Lord may bless it to our hearts uh, this morning. There are many voices today de declaring what God's going to do, and I, d I do want to address that question. Of course, the prime method of interpretation is bringing it to pass. So even when we go back to the prophets of the Old Testament, their prime motivation was simply to deliver the word that God gave them. But many times they didn't understand it. Many times they couldn't, uh, they couldn't grasp what was being spoken. We read in the book of Peter that they searched to know what manner of time and what these things actually meant. And so, and the reason is because God's perfect way of interpreting his word is by bringing it to pass. And when he brings it to pass, then you can see clearly, identify it back on the word of God and know clearly. We know with the first coming of Christ, there were, there were many things throughout the entire scriptures that were spoken about Jesus coming and um, the first coming of the Lord. But nobody was able to actually pull it all together into a, a clearly understandable uh, sequence of events and how things were going to happen. Now, if that was for the first coming, and we have actually more scriptures regarding the second coming in the Bible, then surely the same thing is going to be happening in our day. But we need to take our guide from the only guidebook that we have, and that is the scripture. And I wish to look at the word of God um, uh, and the scriptures concerning this very issue. Now, the other thing I want to emphasize and say is this, that I actually do believe that God did send a message under the spirit of Elijah and that it is, it is God's prophets that identify the seasons and the times and identify the fulfilment of the word of God for our day. So much of what I'm saying is what's been quickened to me through the word of God, through the ministry of God's prophet that he sent in the last days. And I know that a lot of people say they believe it, but you know how, how I know that people believe it? They listen to it and they search it and they try to find out what's actually been said. And to me, it puts everything in context, uh, context in regard to our day. And it's good for us to search end time events. Now, the scripture we read talk, talked about the beginning of sorrows. It talked about a woman in birth pain. And here's the thing that, that's a very important point, I think, that when God is about to f fulfill his word, when he's about to fulfill his word, um, he's, likening, he's likening the end time events to be birth pains. Now, once they start, you can't stop them. Probably would like to, but once they start, you can't stop them. Those birth pains just keep on going until finally they come to the birth. Uh, and, and I believe that the birth pains that we will see in the last days are irreversible. So that it's a process that's going all, th all the way through to the end. It's already, I believe, started. And there's no turning back. There's no reversing of it. There's no reversing of the birth pains. There's, uh, once, once those birth pains start, and the reason that they come is because there is a new world to be delivered. There is a new heavens and a new earth. There's a, there's a millennium period to start with. So we believe that the world today is in birth pains. And I believe that what we're seeing today are simply the beginning of sorrows. Uh, the beginnings of, of, of something greater that is coming. And I wish to talk about that in regard to sorrows because um, I'd like to quote a few statistics to try to put some things into perspe perspective because there is a lot of hysteria at the moment yeah. and um, there's a there's a there's a source that that I got some information from it's called Worldometer Worldometer and it's it's uh, comprises uh, a group of international an international team of developers researchers and volunteers and their goal is to is to make world statistics available it's a very trusted authority it's referred to by the american library association it's referred to by the uk government uh, by john john hopkins um, 
uh, University, I think it is, the Financial Times, the Unite, New York Times, the Business Insider. I say that because there's a lot of stuff out there. We have to really make sure it comes from reputable sources. And even then, we have to be very careful with the information that's given us. But I, I just wanted to um, mention uh, some, of the, um, some of the information that they published. They published recently the number of worldwide deaths from the 1st of January to the 25th of March, 2020. 1st of January to 25th of March. So if, I, if I'd have thought we could have actually got it on the screen, but um, um, I've thought of it just before I, I came in into the church, but uh, it's a, bit, a little bit late. Now, they, they talk about deaths, and they go from the least number of deaths down to the greatest number of de deaths. And it's actually quite illuminating because when we start to talk about tribulation and sorrow, we need to put everything into perspective because I think that it's got out of perspective. Now, 1st of January to March the 25th, that wasn't the peak period for, for coronavirus. It didn't include that which occurred in China before the 1st of January. So there was a, a lot of deaths at that particular time now they quoted a number here, 21,297. Today, that number is 108,000. So you can see that those deaths are increasing. But, but 108,000. Now I want to go through for the same period, and that 108,000 wasn't for this period. That's in total for, uh, for coronavirus, so that we can put it in perspective. The deaths from seasonal flu have been 113,034. Normal flu has killed 113,000 in those three months. 113,000. 228,000 people have been killed from malaria. And as I quote these statistics, you think about the measures that the world could panic and the measures that they could put in place to avoid malaria to avoid being uh, bitten by mosquitoes, etc., uh, or even to avoid seasonal flu. Now, some measures are put in place, like immunisation, etc., but 113,000. Then we come to malaria, 228. Deaths by suicides, 250,000 people in the world committed suicide in those three months. 250,000 people committed suicide. Now, when you bring an economy down and people go bankrupt and out of business around the globe, don't be surprised if our suicide rate goes up. Uh, it certainly, I believe it certainly will. Um, 314,000 deaths by traffic uh, fatalities. So 314,000 people died globally in those three months as a result of traffic accidents. 391,000 died of HIV and AIDS. 391,000 died of HIV. 581 deaths were attributed to alcohol. 581,000 deaths were attributed to alcohol. <clears throat> 1,162,000 deaths from smoking. 1,910,000 deaths from cancer. 2,382,000 deaths from hunger, lack of food. My, how we ought to be grateful. Yes, right. 9,914,000 deaths by abortion. If only the energy that's been put into coronavirus was put into some of these things, we'd see a reduction in deaths. So when we start to talk about the sorrows of the present, I think we need to put it into perspective into perspective of some of the things that have happened in the past and some of the things that are going to happen in the future. Sorrows of the past. I think of the martyrs. 
simply for denying transubstination, which is the conversion of the bread into the literal body and the wine into the literal blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Simply for not believing that, people were thrown into prison and burnt at the stakes. Simple little things like that. Um, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm moved by the fact that the, those overcomers in the book of Revelation, they love not their lives unto the death. To me, the greatest issue for mankind is not when you die, but what happens when you die. What happens after you leave this life, your heart stops speaking, beating, your breath is gone, you leave this life. To me, the answer, of course, is the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know, I quoted to you George Wishart. He chose the East Gate to preach to the sick and dying. This is in that, um, in that uh, Dundee in, in Scotland. And he took his, his text from uh, the word he sent, his, he sent his word and healed them. <clears throat> the heart of the hearers was so raised by the divine force of the discard, uh, discourse as not to regard death. In other words, to them, death was no longer a sorrow. Death was no longer going to be a tribulation or a pain. It's the thing, it's the plague that struck the human race from the beginning in the Garden of Eden. It's still the plague that strikes the human race today. But, you know, uh, uh, they, they, they were so raised by the force of the discount as not to, <clears throat> as not to re regard death, but to judge them more happy who were called to it. Shortly after, George himself was martyred, burnt at the stake while still a young man. I believe he was about just over 30 years old. So there's some of the sorrows of the past. And when we read of the plagues of the past and we think of the comforts, particularly of the Western world, I'm sure that the Eastern, uh, some of the other poorer countries suffer from death through hunger and so forth. But when we think of the, the blessings that we have in this Eastern world, it almost becomes... Um, um, ludicrous to say that we're in great suffering or that we're in great tribulation right at the moment. To me, we need to put all of these things in perspective because there's far worse coming. But I do believe that it's probably going to trigger something <clears throat> that is going to be far worse, that will trigger <clears throat> economic collapse and a collapse of the financial systems of the world. That's me speaking. That's what I feel, which I feel is a far greater evil. Because when that happens, watch out. Satan and the Antichrist system is going to move in to prop the world back up again. And people are going to worship him as a saviour. But there are sorrows to come. When we think of the Great Tribulation, the world will be turned upside down. One third of the people of this world are going to die. You know, and... Um, as Jeremiah said in, in chapter 12 and verse 5, he said, If thou hast run with the horsemen and they have wearied thee, <clears throat> then how canst thou contend with the horses? If we're wearied by the things that we're putting up with right now, which to me is not really a great it's sorrow to those that die, and we feel for that, but there's as many dying of flu from, from the statistics anyway, normal flu. But, you know, he said, uh, if, if thou hast as run with the horsemen and they have uh, footmen and they have wearied thee, how then, how then canst thou contend with the horses? If this generation is finding it difficult to run with the footmen, what about when, when the horses, when they have to keep up with the horses? See, a lot more is coming. And, and, and you know, all of the silly little things that trouble us today, why they mean nothing in the light of what's coming to this world, all the affairs of our life and the things that bother us, why they're going to mean nothing in that day, uh, we just we, we certainly need to know the Lord. Um, and if in the land of peace, wherein thou trustest, they wearied thee, then how wilt thou do in the swellings of, of Jordan? Now, I also believe, and this is just giving a background before I start to talk about um, the, road, uh, the road of no return, I really believe that the world will not repent as a result of this situation. Now, I know there's a lot of clips going around of people praying in the streets, and I thank God to hear people getting desperate enough to get on their knees in the streets and cry out and call out to God. And I thank the Lord for that. But, you know, I do not believe that this generation will repent when this is all over. And the reason I say that is because, because the heart's desires of people will go straight back 
to the things that they're missing. Not in a small measure, but with a vengeance. You know, I, I believe people will be wanting to party. People will be wanting to uh, get more and more involved in sporting events and, and, and public events because they've been restricted. So it's going to unleash desire. You know, when you take something away from somebody, uh, food, for example, and then when, when you r remove those restrictions, there's a huge appetite and desire. So, so uh, <clears throat> you say, well, what do you base that on? I base it on the book of Revelations in many places because when the real sorrows come in the, in the tribulation period, Revelation 16, 11 tells us, and they and blaspheme the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores and repented not of their deeds. In other words, there was no turning back. When, when these things... and, and, and the train is already on the tracks. When these things are set in motion, there's not going, in my view, according to the scripture, there's not going to be a turning back. There's not going to be a reversal in the attitudes of people of this world. There's not going to be, a, uh, a, a, in, in, in the general world and the general populace of this world, there's not going to be people that are going to be seeking out for the living God. There may be individuals, that's true. But in the, in the main, just as the book of Revelation tells us, that, that they blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores and they repented not of their deeds. And believe me, the plagues of Revelation are far worse than anything that we've experienced uh, in the past. Tribulation such as has never been from the beginning of the world. Now, when talking about this road of no return, um, the next point that I want to make is the die is cast. The die is cast. At some stage, the world reaches a point of irreversible change. When birth pains start, it's an irreversible change. It's going to lead to something, but you can't stop it. It's impossible to stop it. All the preachers in the world will never stop it. All the ministries and all the promises that God's going to bless and God's going to do this will never stop it. It will not do it. This is, this is my view from what the scripture says. And I believe just like Jeremiah said, that people are going to wake up and say one day the harvest is over and we are not saved. We never got through. We never got that salvation. I trust that's not us, of course. We believe under salvation and under perseverance to the end. Revelations 22 verse 11. I want to base this on the scripture. Uh, Revelations 22 verse 11. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. Now there's two aspects to that. There's a road of no return for the believer. Right. And there's a road of no return for the unbeliever. Amen. If we're on the path, if we're on the way, if we're in Christ today, we're on an irreversible journey to glory. Amen. And nothing is going to stop us getting there. Not our own weaknesses, not our own failures, not our own troubles, not our own uh, uh, inconsistencies, or even our own unfaithfulness. Because the scriptures tell us, in the Bible, the scriptures tell us that all that the Father has given me will come. And then he that comes to me, I will in no wise cast out. And then Jesus said, this is the will of the Father, that of all those that he, that he has given me, that I should lose none of them. So if it depends on you, you're going to be lost. But if it depends on Jesus... He is well and truly able to keep those that he has called even in this last day. So we're on an irreversible path, an irreversible road to righteousness, to, uh, to holiness and to serving the Lord. And if you see Christians that are, their path takes them into more and more worldliness, uh, the, 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 their dress gets worse and worse, their behaviour gets worse and worse, their activities get worse and worse, their desires get worse and worse, the world comes and floods in. You know they're not on that irreversible path. But the path of the just should go brighter and brighter until that perfect day. So this irreversible road has got a positive about it. By God's grace, we're on the irreversible road. Lord Jesus, keep me. The Father has committed it into Jesus' hands. Uh, uh, this is the will of the Father that I 
should lose none of them, but I would keep every single one of them. So there's not a devil in hell. There's not a trouble in your life. There's not a circumstance that can come that is ever able to get you away from this irreversible road to glory. And even if we have to go through troubles internally, troubles externally, nevertheless, we're on the gospel train and it's taking us home to meet our Lord. So as far as the unbelieving world is concerned, it's an endless pass to judgment. The filthy are going to be filthy still. The righteous are going to be righteous still. Uh, now when we, when we start, the unjust are going to be unjust still. That is not going to get any better. And, and there's no revival, I believe, that is going to be sent to reverse <clears throat> what God has said in his word. Remember, I'll pass away, my voice will pass away, we'll all pass away, but the word of our God abideth forever. This word that we're reading here will never pass away, it will stand forever, it cannot fail, it is the word of Almighty God. So, you say, are there any other uh, examples? What about Egypt? What about the plagues in Egypt? Did Pharaoh repent? Did, uh, did Egypt repent? No. Did Pharaoh put blood on his doorstep? Well, if he, if he did, he would have lived. And his son would have lived. But he didn't do it. Right. Were the Egyptians putting blood on the doorstep? No. Are we putting blood on the doorstep? Yes. yes. By the grace of God, we're putting blood on the doorstep. We are looking, we are, we, are, we are behind the door, but the blood's on the doorstep. And the angel of judgment went through and said, blood's on that doorstep, move on. There was no, no doors were opened. Right. Nobody went inside to see what the people were doing or how they were faring. Right. They just moved on to the next one. The blood's on the doorstep. On to the next one. No blood on the doorstep. Enter in. There's a firstborn in there. Slay the firstborn. And at the multiplied plagues. You know, the, the water turned to blood. No fresh water. Water turned to blood. Plagues of flies until they were everywhere. We get it in the Northern Territory and some of those flies are everywhere. You can, Up your nose, in your ears, everywhere, in your mouth, looking for moisture. Plagues of flies. Then plagues of frogs. Frogs everywhere. Frogs in their bedroom. Frogs under the sheets. Frogs in the kitchen. Frogs in the kneading bo uh, 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 board where you're kneading your bread. Frogs everywhere. Flies, frogs, moraines then came. D diseases came on the, on the cattle and on the people. Uh, itching botches, all kinds of wicked and evil things came upon the Egyptians. And they felt the pain of it. But Pharaoh was harder and harder and harder. And I believe that's exactly how it'll be in the last days. People are going to get harder and harder and harder and harder and there will be no turning. It's an irreversible process and it's only going to get worse. Let me say when Israel, bringing it down to our day, when Israel rejected the sign of the Messiah, it was all over for that nation. And I say if this generation or even the previous generation and this generation rejects the sign that God gave to it to say that Sodom is going to be burnt, the same biblical sign that Jesus manifests, the same sign that was manifest in Sodom and Gomorrah, the same sign that heralded the end of time, and yet it is, goes unrecognised, and uh, uh, I can understand that because... Surely, uh, surely Satan doesn't want people to hear that. But then it not only goes unreconciled, it goes unheeded. And I say in this last day, we can never diminish. We can never diminish the fact that God gave a voice to Lady Asiya. And that that voice, as uh, I believe it's uh, one of the prophets, um, uh, it might be Zephaniah, says the day of the voice of the Lord. And I believe God gave a voice. He gave a witness to tell us what God was expecting of the Christians in the last days. To give a sign to the world that it's going to be burnt. Reject that. And I ask you, did Sodom repent? Sodom didn't repent. Did they repent in the days of Noah? No, they didn't. 
It just, it was an irreversible pass. When the world gets onto that pass that we're on at the moment, they're not going to get off that. It's an irreversible pass to judgment. And you think, when I read that statistic about the abortions, nine point, nearly 10 million abortions in three months. Three months. Nothing but murder. Right. Think about it. Where's the outcry? Where are the medical doctors? Some of them may be uh, legitimate in regard to medical issues, but, but the majority are not. I would suggest the majority or not. I don't have the stats on it. So, you know, uh, we're, we're, uh, that's to the unbeliever. It's an irreversible. The die is set. Let the filthy be filthy still and the righteous be righteous still. And now the third point that I want to make is, will there be an awakening? Will there be an awakening for this generation? Yes, there will. There will be an awakening. There will be an awakening, awakening right at the end. Let's read the, uh, let's read the whole of that parable of the uh, uh, wise and the foolish virgins. Matthew 25, verses 1 to 13. And I know you're familiar with it. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them the wise, and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. So we see oil was the issue. They took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. Now, let me just stop there and say this. The foolish think that simple fundamentalism will get them through. Fundamentalism, I'm not saying it won't save them, but in this hour, we need to have oil in our lamps. Fundamental teaching, Bible teaching is good and wonderful, but without the Holy Spirit, how are we ever going to get through? That's what Jesus' parable was talking about here. He said, uh, uh, but the wise, they took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. Now, we're, the truth of the matter is we need an awakening. Yes. I need an awakening, but I can't wake myself. When you're asleep, it takes somebody else to rouse you. It takes some, and it's never pleasant. Not if you're in a good sleep and a good slumber. Just leave me alone, will you? And I think that's how sometimes we feel, that we don't want anything to interfere with us. Let us slumber for a little longer. Let us sleep a little longer. But there's coming an hour, a midnight hour, when there's going to be a cry go out and there'll be an awakening amongst the people that this is the hour of destiny. This is the time when Christ is coming. This is the time when there's going to be a, 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 a return of Jesus Christ and a tribulation. And, and so the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom uh, tarried, they all slumbered and slept. Now, we have to be honest with ourselves. The world needs an awakening. Here's the other thing. We're no better, we're no better than the foolish virgin. If we have the oil in our lamp, we're no better than them. We're actually, that oil, wonderful it is, is it didn't stop them slumbering and sleeping. It didn't stop them getting weary and, and, and virtually backsliding in a sense. It's going to take the grace of God to awaken us and it's going to take the grace of God to give us the oil and he promised he'd do it and I believe he will. Amen. And at midnight there was a cry made. Behold the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Then all those virgin, virgin, virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, give us of your oil. Now we want that Holy Ghost religion but it's too late. For our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us. We need every bit of the Holy Ghost that God can give us. Amen. Every bit of it. And more and more and more. And let me tell you, you have to buy for yourself. You're not going to get it from a preacher. You're not going to get it from pastors. You're not going to get it from a church. You're not going to, you need to go to the one that actually sells the oil. And he sells it freely, without price. He gives it freely. And it's based upon a promise that he ascended on high. And he was given the promise of the Father. And God, therefore, has shed abroad the Holy Ghost upon that church. 
Praise God for that. And they that went in, uh, and, and while they went to buy the, the bridegroom come, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Afterward, uh, they came also the other virg virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. Now, there's a few points that I want to talk about. One is, I don't believe those virgins were lost, not any of the ten. But they had a different portion, a different lot given to them. The wise, they go into the marriage supper of the Lamb. The foolish go into the great tribulation. They're not lost, they're virgins. They have lived clean. I would say that we wouldn't be able to put all of Christianity under that heading. When I say the, the, the pattern of their life is not after the world or after the desires of the world, but is after Christ. So there will, there will be an awakening, awakening That's right. but it'll be too, too late. And there's only two categories. The awakening will let the true virgins know that the hour has come and they've got the oil to go. The awakening of the foolish virgins will, we haven't got what it takes to get us through. We never got it. We refused it. When it was offered, we didn't believe in it. Our preachers were good. Uh, I won't say... <laughs> I won't mention any denomination. You know who the fundamentalist denominations are. They were against the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And even in this, our very message, we have to be very careful ourselves to remember that it is, it is the oil that separates the bride from the rest. It is the oil. Nothing else, the oil. So only those two categories. The Lord didn't identify denominations or churches, all of those man-made facades. God looks right through that and he deals with us as individuals, every one of us. We've got no claim because we go to Faith Tabernacle or we're part of the Adelaide Christian Fellowship. We've got no more to boast about because of what God has done for us. It's all by his grace and his mercy. That's all. But God looks right through that and looks on all of us as individuals. So, the awakening was for who? It wasn't for the world. That's right. The world won't be awakened. That's right. The world will go headlong, blindly into tribulation. But the virgins, the Christian believers, those with and without the oil, they themselves are going to be awakened. So, it's the virgins that are awakened. It isn't that millions of souls being saved under an awakening, like in Finney's day or Moody's day or even going back to uh, Pentecost at the turn of the 20th century and then all the revivals that followed since then. So it was for the virgins. This awakening was for the virgins, not for millions, I believe. My understanding is not for millions of new souls. Jesus talked about an awakening, but only to virgins. And then the next point is there'll be a latter rain outpouring. So there'll be an awakening and there will be an outpouring. We see that. We need to look at them uh, in isolation, though they work together. And I'm just trying to put uh, what, what I believe the scriptures are relevant for our time. Joel chapter 2, verses 23 to 25. Be glad then, you children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God. For he hath given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former and the latter rain in the first month. Now let me tell you, he said rejoice before the rain comes. Right. He wasn't saying rejoice when the rain comes. We will rejoice when the rain comes. But he said rejoice. Why do we rejoice? Because it's a promise of God. Amen. We rejoice because God has given us a promise. Amen. And we believe the promise. It's not even up to us to bring it to pass. God will do it. And then I believe the Spirit of God will so move within the hearts of the believers that they'll begin to cry out and call on God for the latter rain and the time of the latter rain, and then the rain will come and sweep. Amen. Now, he said, for he, uh, he goes on and says, And the floor shall be full of wheat, 
and the fats shall overflow with, flow with wine and oil, and I will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten, the canker worm and the caterpillar and the palmer worm, my great army which I sent amongst you. So everything that Satan destroyed through the seven church ages is going to be restored. Everything that Satan destroyed in the, in, in the kingdom of Israel is going to be restored. I will restore, saith the Lord. So we see here, I will restore to you the years, all the years, ever. Think of a blessing that ever happened, all the way back. Think of any blessing that happened in any age that you've ever read about. God said, I'll restore that back. Not just uh, an, another, another year's blessing or another season's blessing, but all seasons put together. All the blessings of the days that the locusts have eaten, the candle worm and the caterpillar and the palmer worm, my great, great army which I sent amongst you. Just let me, let me tell you, Satan's got an army of bugs. That army of bugs wants to destroy and take away our joy, wants to take away uh, the, the love for God, wants to take away everything that God does within our lives. The caterpillar, the canker worm, the caterpillar, the palmer worm, are eating away the fruits, eating away the fellowship, the leaves off the tree. And I don't, I, as much as I believe in, in cases where people need to have uh, the internet to have fellowship in times like this, I still believe that the that we need fellowship. We need to be together. Yes. We need to be assembled together. Because yes. those bugs eat off the leaves, the fellowship and the fruits and the bark and everything else. But there will come a great outpouring upon earth. And um, this will not just be on the bride of Christ. Now, if you haven't studied or read that message, uh, uh, spoken word is the original seed, you'll see that he talks about how the seed has been sown. All different types of seed. Religious seed. Uh, the, 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 the foolish virgins receive their seed. The wise virgin, virgins receive their seed. There's a pure word that God said he would restore. The restore us to it. Because the, the word doesn't need restoration. We need restoration to the word. But... But uh, he, he said he would restore. And then when the, the latter rain comes, it's sent for a purpose. It's sent to take his bride home, which will only be in a minority. But it will, be fall, it will fall out upon the, upon the peoples of this world. And they will feel they're in a revival and everything's going to be right for them. You know, the rain falls on the just and on the unjust. You know, the, 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 that blessing can fall upon a hypocrite. It can fall upon anybody. Um, we have to be careful in the application of that because uh, sometimes we all feel a bit hypocritical in ourselves at times. The Lord forgive us. But, but this outpouring that's going to come upon the, upon the earth, I believe Psalm 68 verse 9, wonderful scripture. Thou, O God, did sense the plentiful rain, whereby thou didst confirm thine inheritance. Here we see the rain is sent to confirm the bride of Jesus Christ and the sons and daughters of God. It's sent for their confirmation. When that rain falls, it'll fall on everybody, but it's specifically sent to get the bride of Christ ready for that great translation. What a time that'll be. Amen. Thank the Lord. He said, Thou, uh, uh, God, didst send a plentiful rain, whereby thou didst confirm thy inheritance. When? When it was weary. In a weary time. In a weary age. In a weary day. That's why we slumber sometimes. In a weary time. In a slumbering time. In a weary time. In a time of... We get sick of it. There's so much oppression that comes over media and over the airwaves and everything else. I remember I, in the air, I felt so frustrated. Uh, actually, I was getting so much stuff coming to me when this whole thing started. I got totally frustrated. I said, I don't want to hear any more of that. I want to just read my Bible. I want to get back to the Word of God. And I want to be in prayer. And I was trying to read my Bible, but, you know, it was just taking time and time uh, away from us and we dealt with that on Friday so this will be to confirm his heritage James chapter 5 and verse 7 
There's another point to be made about this latter rain. Be patient, therefore, brethren, under the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth and hath long patience for it until he received the early and the latter rain. So he said, he's waiting for the precious fruit. So the fruit's already on the tree. It's just not ripened. It's just not ready yet to be taken. You don't go and pick green figs. You don't go and pick green plums. You wait until they get to that point of ripeness where just at a perfect time when the sugar has come in and it's just beautiful when you pick a ripe peach or apricot or plum or a fig or whatever uh, you, you enjoy when it, when it comes to maturity. Here I want to say this. The fruit is already on the tree. But he has to wait for the latter rain. Now there's another thing. That's why the timing of the latter rain has got to be perfect. You know, if you don't get enough water, that fruit is just all shriveled. It's all really small. But there's a time for that latter rain. I remember talking, and I've mentioned this before, but I, I was talking to a brother in New Zealand. He's gone to be with the Lord now. But he was saying that we got... The rains came, unseasonal rains came, and he said all of his plums were really green and it split them all. They just couldn't handle the rain. It was the wrong time. And so I believe that's why ask for the latter rain in the time of the latter rain. That's why people are saying, oh, we should be doing this and we should be doing that. We should be praying for this. And, and I, we are praying and we are believing, but it's got to come in God's time because when it comes in God's time, it will produce what God knows. And God knows when we need that and he knows the timing when we need it. So we send it right on time. Not too late and not too early, but just exactly on time. So, therefore, it didn't come to produce another tree. It didn't come to produce the fruit, but it came to ripen what the Bible calls is precious fruit. Now, I believe the bride of Christ is precious fruit, fruit to the Lord Jesus Christ. And there, he, was, he was the husband's waiting on the early and latter rain. So this will bring all seeds, not just, not just the bride of Christ, it'll bring all seeds to manifestation. All seeds. But there'll be a seed that is the bride of Christ that is part of the word of God, that will manifest in that day as the sons of God, and it will be like a Mount Carmel showdown in which God is going to, or Mount Zion showdown, sorry, that is going to identify the true children of God, and they'll be a remnant and in a minority, and they'll be caught away to meet the Lord in the air. It won't be masses of thousands and millions and millions of people going. It'll be just like like the days of Noah and just like the days of Sodom and Gomorrah. So he said, lo, so, so he says, this, uh, the, the, the scriptures are talking about bringing all seed to maturity and completion. Not all seed is that perfect seed. And there will be a manifestation as we've seen it in a forerunner. We've seen people that have been anointed and Balaam was one. We've seen it in the Bible days. We've seen it all in the last days. There'll be false anointed ones. We've got that message on, on false anointed ones and, and so forth. There will be anointings come in the last days. There will This anointing will produce whatever seed they are of. And, but if it falls, and it'll fall on the bride of Christ, and it will produce what God said it would. The next point I want to make, just quickly, is the remnant will be saved. The remnant are to be saved. None, and I know I'm repeating myself, but I want to say this, none of God's elect seed will be lost. Amen. None of our children that are elected to, to this will be lost. Right. And so we have our confidence in that. And God has a plan for every individual seed. We should never look on the outside and get discouraged. We should believe God has a plan for every individual seed of God. And that we rest in the confidence of that. If God chooses for our children, our loved ones, our associates to be part of this, 
then we praise God because it's the right choice. If he chooses not, however, it's still the right choice. God knows what he's doing. Some won't even come up until the second resurrection. The remnant will be that small number. And I believe this is all about the remnant. It's all about a bride to Jesus Christ. That's why Jesus came, to get himself a bride. I know there'll be others coming in through the white throne judgment. I know the foolish virgins will come into the kingdom and they'll have their part in the kingdom of God. I can't interpret all of that to you because I don't understand it. We're going to have to let the Lord interpret that. But these are just some of the basic principles that I think are really important. So uh, Amos chapter 9 verse 9 says, For lo, I will command, and I will sift the house of Israel among all nations. Like as corn is sifted in a sieve, it shall not the least grain fall upon the earth. He said, I'll not lose a single grain. Amen. Now, you imagine going after the harvest has gone through, the harvest has gone through. You imagine being given the task on a 50-acre plot, and remember, God's plot is the whole world. On a 50-acre plot, you've got to go through that field and you've got to find every single grain that the harvester didn't pick up. Oh, my goodness. I, I, there's no way you would. You couldn't do it, but God's able to. Because God knows where they all are. He knows where they're at at the moment. He knows where they'll be in the future. He knows the beginning and the end. He knows everything. So he knows how to find them. And he has a plan to bring them. And he said, I'm not going to lose one grain. You can go over the whole world and you won't find one child of God that I have not brought through. Amen. That's the confidence that we have in the Lord. Amen. The next point I want to say is, we talked about an awakening. Then we talked about an outpouring of the Spirit, a latter rain outpouring. But all of that is nothing compared to what, what, it, what it ends up in. It ends up in a resurrection. And that is the thing that the church has been waiting for for 2,000 years, is that glorious resurrection. So in order, we've got the awakening, the outpouring, and then a resurrection and the translation. The final stage of the redemption of God's children is the resurrection from the dead. Now, there were resurrections that took place in Bible days. That's true. There have been resurrections that have taken place in, 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 in the 20th century, the 21st century, back in the early church. And I'm sure throughout the ages, people have been resurrected, but they died again. Right. But we're talking about a resurrection where we're not going to die again. Amen. Praise the Lord. A resurrection, not just back to this life, but a resurrection to immortality. Amen. Or can you put a value on that? My, why, there's no way we can do it. This was beyond Pentecost. This is beyond Pentecost. Pentecost didn't bring this, but it was promised. And Pentecost is the foundation upon which this will take place. For if that same spirit that dwell in Christ dwell in you, it will also quicken your mortal bodies. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verses 51 to 54 says this, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. But we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. Won't be any work up. Happens so quickly. It's in the twinkling of an eye. Won't be, we'll pray our way through. No, God will visit. It'll be done in a twinkling. Hallelujah. One minute we're in mortal bodies. Next thing we're in immortality. Quickened by the power of the Holy Spirit. Praise God. The potential for that is within the believer. By the Spirit of the Lord. Yes. For this corruptible must put on incorruptible, and this mortal must put on immortal, immortality. For when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written Death is swallowed up in victory. We shall be caught up together with the whole body of believers from all the ages. And I tell you, we might be only a little part of it, but it's just, just to be part of it will be a wonderful thing. So there comes a resurrection. But this is all for the remnant. This is all for the election of God. This isn't for the world. This isn't a mass revival where millions of souls are saved. 
Now, I haven't believed that. I might be wrong, and if I am wrong, I praise God I'm wrong. Because I would rather that millions of souls did get saved. I would rather, how many years do we labour and see so little fruits in regard to salvation, how we would long to see souls swept into the kingdom of God. And will there be any brought in? Well, the remnant will be brought in, regardless of the time they'll be brought in according to God's plan. So what are, we go- what are we going to do? We will continually and continue to declare the salvation of God and preach the gospel, yes. uh, not as if men were lost and had no hope, but that there is a promise that if they'll call on the name of the Lord, they shall be saved. Amen. While there is a day, we will proclaim the salvation of God. Even in the book of Joel, chapter 2, it goes, I'm not going to read 30 through to 32, we're, we're, we're pressing on time here. But it says in verse 32, talking of that great and terrible day uh, to, uh, of darkness and so forth uh, and judgment. It says in verse 32, And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as the Lord hath said, and in the remnant, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. We will not abandon hope. Right. Now, in closing, I just want to uh, give a little testimony because some of these things were, because I was hearing different things and it was perplexing me a little bit because, you know, trying to, I was trying to rationalise how things may come to pass and, and, um, and today I've told you how I've, I've always believed it and I believe it this way still, even this morning. But, you know, um, as I was thinking about these things and concerned that people may be thinking, well, there's hope there's going to be a great big revival, millions of souls are going to be saved, I was getting myself into a bit of a perplexity uh, about this whole subject, about what was going to happen next uh, on God's calendar. And I was actually listening uh, to a sermon uh, on YouTube and it ended. And then something really strange happened. You know, on my, on my, on my iPhone, um, if I've selected a certain album, it'll always go back to that album and it'll play it. So, but that doesn't happen. That doesn't happen when I've just finished a sermon. And all of a sudden, a song came on. I have not listened to that album. I bought it years ago and I've, I don't listen to it. It's, I have listened to it in, in times past. But there was, a mess, there was a song on it and it's the Lord's Prayer. It was beautifully sung too. It was that little girl, Jackie Avenko. I don't know whether you remember her. Uh, she was a very talented young girl. And I think she came from a Christian home. But she was singing Our Father which art in heaven. And it, just, it was just beautiful. And then she sang those words, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. I tell you, such a revelation struck me that it, we don't need to get perplexed about any of this. We need to just pray, Lord, thy kingdom come. And whatever is to come, thy will be done on earth as it is done in heaven. And it was so uplifting. I thought, Lord, that's what you want me to do. Not get perplexed or not get anxious about all of the different things that are being said and so forth. But just have one prayer only. No matter how it comes, no matter what I believe, no matter what anybody else believes, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is done in heaven. And then, of course, the last words there in that, in that uh, beautiful prayer that our Lord gives us. The more and more I think about the Lord's Prayer, the more and more I believe it has just got so much in it. And it finally says, for thine is the kingdom. It's not ours, it's his. Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. So we are not to get concerned um, 
We just need to take a, a bigger picture and a bigger view of the greatness of God and of the mightiness of our Redeemer and of our God that is going to have his own way. Our God, his kingdom to come, his will be done on earth as it is done in heaven. Praise the Lord. Well, if the musicians can come, we'll... we'll um, Let's sing that chorus. Give me oil in my lamp. Keep me burning. Give me oil in my lamp, I pray. Because he lives, so shall we live. This is, this is Easter resurrection morning. Yes. I haven't spent a lot of time on it, but we finish with the resurrection. That's the glory of it all. And because he rose, we'll rise also. Because he lives, we'll live also. So we sing uh, that hymn. It's in the um, redemption hymnal. Um, it's number 108, 186. Up from the grave he arose with a mighty triumph over, the, over his foes.
And you know there's going to be a meeting in the air, and we'll close with that uh, chorus. There's going to be a meeting in the air. It's 181 in the restoration. There's going to be a meeting in the air. Praise the Lord. <clears throat> and that's coming very soon. Bless his name. To those watching by video and to any that uh, are listening um, to the audio, let me admonish you all and let me encourage you all that Jesus Christ has enough oil to fill every one of our vessels and that he has given a divine promise to fill us with the Holy Ghost. Let's believe God that in whatever space of time we have left, God's going to fill every one of our vessels to overflowing. And let's believe that God is going to so fill us with that quickening power that we'll be present there on that day. So may the Lord bless you. We're just going to close with a word of prayer. And I just want to say that within about 35 minutes at 12 o'clock our time, we will be starting the second service. And I just pray that the Lord will uh, bless that to you also. So we'll pray now. Father, we appreciate. Lord, I appreciate the help us here this morning, Lord, to get this streaming done. Appreciate, Lord God, the unseen audience. Yes. And Lord God, it's there's an unseen heavenly audience. Yes. Lord, when you're present, the majority is present. And Lord, we just thank you for that. I believe you've been present this morning. I just pray, Lord Jesus, that the word of God would take an anchor in all of our hearts, not to discourage us, but to encourage us to believe God and to know that we are in the hands of Jesus Christ, who is under a great commission, a commission from Almighty God, that he should lose none of those that have been given to him. Amen. Father, we thank you, Lord, and we bless you, and we praise you this morning. And I pray, Lord God, that you be with us and, and be with your children at this time, Lord. May we advance in the kingdom of God. And we pray, Lord Jesus, as you taught us to pray, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is done in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and forever. Amen. Amen. Praise God. The Lord bless you.